Hello, welcome to the Unifying Force. I'm Kat, joined by David Geo. How's it going? Hey, hey, everything is well here. So we today just, yeah. we are going to talk about the trailers for Star Wars Outlaws and Tales, Tales of, of the, the Empire. Empire. We, 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 I've, I've already talked about on some of the... Um, the watch alongs and stuff, how, how people need to go back and watch previous episodes of the unifying force, because we, we called this, we were calling it tales of the Sith. Um, but we we've talked about how this should happen and how this should go down. Now, maybe we will still yet, if this one goes well, still get a tales of the Sith. I, I like that concept. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, th I think this one's going to be a cool one, too. Which one we want to hit first? What do we think? Outlaws, maybe? Yeah. Let's do Outlaws. Cool. That one's the, the freshest the, the freshest one in my mind. Even though I think has it, news of this has been out for a while. Like, talk yeah. of the game has been around, and I've seen images and things like that. But they just hit a like a, a story a, a story based trailer just just rolled out um so so what do we think what's up Gio? yeah i i like the idea of it um i was revisiting um the official launch trailer so it, that came out and when i look at these things on youtube i like to try and you know actually watch the ubisoft uh, official page because yeah, yeah. you can see when these uh, trailers drop and are first released um, so it's 10 months ago since we got the Star Wars Outlaws world premiere trailer so where it fully was announced and it was about three minutes of uh, CGI uh, just introducing us to um, the the sort of setting the main protagonist Kay Vess um, and her uh, her alien uh, companion Nyx and this kind of scoundrel universe side of Star Wars that people have been kind of begging to explore and see in other media, whether it's in 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 film or on TV. Um, and we finally got it. We finally have the non-Rebel or Empire or Jedi or Sith binary kind of classic struggle. And we've got the people on the fringe and kind of in the middle, uh, whether it's the scoundrels or the bounty hunters or uh, people, you know, like like Jango Fett said, just trying to make their way in the universe. Well, and you know, the hive of scum and villainy as well is we're we're getting um, a number of crime syndicates in this trailer, including a brand new crime syndicate that they've invented for this game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they've, I think they've got four established crime syndicates, and then the new one which the kind of antagonist will be the, the kind of the leader of. Um, so we've got the Pikes, which everyone will know well from the yeah. uh, Book of Boba Fett and a lot of ancillary material as well. They've always been kind of... Um, having... Pikes have been in, were in all over the Clone Wars, I think. There yeah, was yeah. A lot of the they Season were... 7 and the, the, um, the Sisters the and the Ahsoka arc in there. Yeah, yeah, the Shadow Collective with the um, the Night the Night Brothers of Maul and Savage, um, and uh, yeah, also involved in the Mandalorian plots um, at various times and the kind of little civil wars that were breaking out, um, instigated by you know the separatists or uh, and causing um, a lot of dissent, uh, and then you've got the return of Crimson Dawn which mm -hmm. I think is a huge selling point for a lot of people because uh, um, Solo, a Star Wars story, I think has a pretty positive, solid fan base, yeah. um, despite what it did at the box office. Um, and it was a great standalone story, but it introduced a lot of these, uh, again, the kind of more uh, gray area characters who are, are either part of the scum and villainy that we know of or of more organized crime syndicates and there will be the return of uh, Kira from Solo you know she was headlined with Han herself, himself in that film and she'll be a character leading uh, Crimson Dawn in this which is quite exciting to bring a character that was had a lot of potential 
And I think people wanted to see a story continuation from her and the stuff in the comics. And now it can be realized. Well, I, and I think that, that that just leads so much of a possibility because for those who haven't seen it, okay, you may want to pause us and stop right here and go look at this trailer if you haven't, because spoilers are about to like abound. Um, this takes place between Empire and Jedi. Okay, it, the, the trailer places itself there. So we're getting Kira back while Han is in Carbonite. So, you know, and, and we see Han in Carbonite in the trailer. That's that's factoring in with and not just like in passing, like the main character is there. Kira, Han and Carbonite. Overlapping, what happens? I don't know. Does you know Jabba like rent him out and hang on her wall for a while, and she's just like, oh, I, told you so. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> rotating mantelpiece of carbonite. Exactly. <laughs> rent him out. <laughs> or, and, and Jabba, by the way, in the trailer is gorgeous. Okay, just the <laughs> rendering of that Jabba is. I mean, he's at least as good in this trailer as he totally is in in the special edition. Like Java is Java. I mean, it's 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 somewhat got a little okay, yeah, it's CG. Okay, yeah, it's thing. It's it's a little bit different than the practical Java. Um, mm -hmm. but the CG job, it's it's very nice. A lot of the CG characters are very nice. Um, mm -hmm. almost all of the aliens. I think I think the humans are still a little bit wonky. They're not quite there is to like you know your deep fake luke skywalker which was a little bit off anyway but like like but, but yeah it's it, all the aliens and the stuff look really nice um i do think the the a the atst for for example didn't look as cool as at night it looked like really flat and not not shaded as 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 well as it could have been but a lot of the, the rest of the world, and there are worlds and worlds and worlds that are involved in this. I mean, they, you know, they got to take us back to Tatooine. One, check. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. where, are you, where else are you going to find Java? You can't be too mobile. <laughs> exactly. We take us back to Tatooine. There are some places. But they do promise us that there are parts of Tatooine that we haven't seen before. There are places in Moss Eisley and different places, but they've created brand new planets for this. Like the dumpster behind the cantina. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Where they dragged Guido's body. <laughs> but they've taken, they, they've created brand new planets. I think I saw in one that there's a lot of it takes place or a main planet. The creators from Ubisoft went and went to Tanzania. I think, and and really kind of to capture the feel. So you've got these vast grasslands and different places and kind of rock outcroppings and there's cities there. So they're they're making it feel real. Um, and it's it's just massively, ma I mean, I, I said before in the pre-show is this is getting to the point where they're going to have to redefine open world is this is open worlds where we're going to the point of open galaxy. Um, mm -hmm. So what do you uh, think? Yeah. What did you get from the trailer? I thought the, anim I agree that the animation on the human characters was a bit wonky. Yeah. I not too sure on the entirety of what the story is. They're kind of hinting at it a little bit. It's like, okay, because you wonder, is this going to be like Grand Theft Auto where there's like a main storyline, but you can just go off and do whatever you want, uh, like with a bunch of side missions? Or is it going to be uh, like, oh, it's open world and that we get to take you to a bunch of places, but you're stuck on the story? Uh, the, I agree that the aliens look really cool. Most of the animation is great. Um, characters, okay. I'm interested in watching. I, I want to play it, though. Like an open world Star Wars game that's not a handheld thing like Star Wars Galaxies. It's like, no, I want to play that. Because it's like, currently the only Star Wars games that say play through the movies are like the Lego games. They don't have, and then the one-off Revenge of the Sith and, you know, Phantom Menace. But those, well, Revenge of the Sith one was a really good game. But most well, that was so much fun. The Lego Star Wars yeah. are all amazingly fun. And, you know, 
I, I'm sure you're playing it on something far more updated, but I'm I like loved it on GameCube. You know. Yeah, like, I, 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 the, I had the uh, <laughs> Re- Revenge of the Sith for PS2, which doesn't work anymore, so I can't play it. But I like the idea that we could have a, a live action looking Star Wars game again. That's not like I shouldn't have to like the Lego games. Yeah, they're fun, but that shouldn't be my only option for going to visit all the cool classic Star Wars planets. Yeah, I think the yeah. the last one that I had that was a live action y whatever Star Wars game, and, and granted I'm behind it and don't do it, is when I, I Force Unleashed when I went out and got like lightsaber attachments for my Wiimotes. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> oh, oh nice. pop the Wiimote <laughs> into a lightsaber and you press the button. Woo, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's a, that, that's um, great crap. It's a visceral Star Wars experience. experience. Um, yeah, I think that was uh, the Force Unleashed. I think the has did a, a lot of power fantasy for Star Wars fans for a long time, and it was kind of really amping up the Force powers to to the levels that would, <laughs> uh, I guess, break immersion for some people and just be too wild for others. But it was really fun. And I think if you can just make sure there's a good connect between player and gameplay, um, irrespective of the story, the most important part for me will always be gameplay. Just like his cat saying, you want to experience it yourself and see how it is. Um, a great story, I think, would be a good plus. But um, uh, yeah, if I had to, not that you should have to choose one or the other in what's described as a you know AAA blockbuster <laughs> Star Wars video game. Um, and open world but uh, if you've got the gameplay that um, f- from some of the descriptions that I read um, uh, around some of the analysis of so there were some people who were invited to um, to Malmo in Sweden so the developer is called mm-hmm. Massive Entertainment they're a Swedish um, developer that did the division games um, the Tom Clancy uh, sort of shooters uh, like tactical shooters, and mm-hmm. uh, they did the Avatar recent game, Frontiers of Pandora, which I yeah, think Avatar, was a sort like of open world game. Open it, world it, Pandora, it, it, same engine as that, right? Is that's the that's yeah the game engine? Yeah, that's a very recent. So I'm hoping that was a really not that that should get game should have been like a a first draft or a dress rehearsal, but I hope that was a good dry run for this game um, because it. I don't know anyone personally who's played. Um, Frontiers of Pandora, but it looked pretty solid in terms of giving you an immersive experience on different planets um, or maybe even just on Pandora, but with different environments. And right. We know Star Wars is quite a one, bio do- one biome for a whole planet type uh, galaxy setup. So if we can get um, that kind of diversity with environments as well as a lot of interactions with NPCs that you know can offer you um, side mission, side quests, but also uh, give you the feeling of choice. I think some of my best Star Wars memories for video games are the Night Star Republic and mm. feeling the idea of just directing a conversation the way that you want and feeling as if you are genuinely influencing the the characters that you are in your squadron. Um, you know, on your on the Ebon Hawk with you, or uh, the characters that you might have say in star wars outlaws so the the current trailer looks like you will have uh a recommissioned separatist commando droid nd5 mm-hmm. being part of your uh your crew um and yeah that just feeling like you can kind of influence a team and also make decisions that are more organic i think if they can capture that feel um and the these mechanics were again expanded by um bioware for the mass effect games which were amazingly popular and for the most part ran um extremely well on multiple systems and you know they've been re-released for this generation again uh because they're so popular and giving that feeling of kind of a third person action perspective that um you can interact with your environment um you can uh have multiple ways of playing through a specific scenario so shall i go stealthy keep things quiet, avoid the security cams, use my um, my axotal-looking alien buddy as a distraction, as a diversion, 
um, or shall I go all guns blazing? Having those kind of options to play would be great to to have uh, in this game. Yeah, and I think it's got a lot of gameplay diversity as well. Uh, what the trailer did for me was immediately make me seek out gameplay because there have been gameplays mm -hmm. shown and and Ubisoft has provided that to some some game reviewers so they could they could talk about it further. Um, so I've I looked at the, a bunch of that and there's like okay speeder bike riding stuff okay we're going mm -hmm. moving around there's that there there's a ship you you get your own distinctive ship in in this and there's uh ship combat there appears to be um and then as well as the the sneak and peek and the move around the map in tears as well as it looked like it's it, it, it's a lot of flipping jumping parkour from rooftop to rooftop like you would see in like old school prince of persia or something um <clears throat> so a lot of really kind of variety what I hope is that they, they've talked about the planets that there are and that they've created a new planet. But if they're giving you Star Wars open world, what I hope they haven't skimped on is letting you be able to go to worlds that might not have to do with your mission. But if it's a main world in Star Wars canon, it needs to be on there. You know, if mm -hmm. I want to go to Hoth, for no reason other than I'm going to Hoth, e e wh how, why can't I? Is can the Navi computer somehow not find it? You know, <laughs> if I want to go to Coruscant, I better be able to go to Coruscant or Naboo. Is you know, it, it's got to be there. Okay, you know, I, I don't know that it needs to go to the level where I can go visit the Astro asteroid field where Alderaan used to be but you know <laughs> and, and and but i i hope to goodness that they've put that much into it that 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 stuff is there in addition to what you need for the gameplay i mean yeah have things that that direct you back to the mission is like you know somebody calls on the comms and say hey we need you over here you need to do uh, uh the things that like bug you and remind you that there is a mission, but let me do what I want to do. I don't know. Um, yeah, I think the ability to have more freedom to play as you want in a kind of sandbox way uh, would be really great. Um, but just looking at some of the worlds and seeing the so i found um, a 12 minute and again this i think was from uh, ubisoft's official youtube channel it was 12 minutes of gameplay um, and this was from some months ago actually but it felt like a good step on from looking at this trailer that released two days ago um, and it was a, a situation where k so our main character k is in this sort of industrial looking shipping uh kind of deck area and it's the pikes everywhere and you can hear the pikes kind of chattering with each other grumbling about the empire uh having this kind of little talk that just makes the world feel more realized and the kind of gameplay options were as you say kind of platforming so jumping onto this kind of conveyor belt thing with this box being moved from across the room and you're kind of clambering on the side of it to keep hidden from view and then jumping down and sneaking into the shadows again and then really weighing up which which direction you're going to go to either disarm some of these characters or just try and sneak by with minimum of fuss and your um the critter nix the the kind of companion to yeah. our main character you can use him to exactly like was revealed in the first world premiere trailer uh genuinely direct him to jump onto enemies and just cause them to be completely distracted unable to like pull their rifle out their blaster and then you can take them out quickly um it looks like it's borrowed also and and i hoped this would be the case with star wars outlaws uh a game mechanic from red dead redemption which is the um the kind of quick draw system mm -hmm. um and so you can it looks like uh kind of so in red dead redemption it's called dead eye 
where you basically had bullet time and for a fraction you could if you had your bar filled you could initiate this moment where things slow down and you just quickly take aim at multiple opponents and then fire and then the world kind of ramps up and speeds back to normal mm -hmm. um, and there's a similar mechanic here um, that looked pretty good in the gameplay uh, which is promising because you can have a whole list of things they promise but unless they're realized in game it's that's just <laughs> it's, it's just conjecture really yeah. um, so i was glad to see that in action and that was from some months ago so hopefully things will be more refined when the game launches well see i want to just say right now that i don't care well like like I, I don't know how long it'll be before I play this game because I don't have a current system. I'm, I'm a couple of things back, but I hope this hits big because I want to see Nyx in a creature stall at Batu. Okay. I want this to hit major and I, he is cuter than Porgs. And it's like, mm -hmm. that is the thing that needs to hit and, and work and see that. Um, and I love a lot of the, the kind of, the look I, I want merch for this game already and, and just from the trailer i want merch for this game i i want to see like black series figures of some of these characters um mm -hmm. it, it looks really nice it is i i hope this hits as big as and it took a while for the other to hit as as big as you know you we get a cow this lightsaber and stuff like that um and I really want to see what Lucasfilm and Disney do with this property because uh, the videos, the review videos are saying this story that they're, they're working a lot in making this story and making a new crime syndicate and making these characters. This story is canon. This story happened in the Star Wars universe. So they're fitting it in between what we know has happened between um, Empire and Jedi, and and this could potentially. I, I can't imagine it won't spin off some comics, maybe at least, and we'll get to see um, some other aspects of it. I'd love to. Yeah. Um, we could we, maybe it'll spin it, off our our, I think our Wars a solo story, Kira, like we we really have been wanting forever. I think what it spins off or what merchandise will have to do a lot with the reception of the game first, and yeah. then we'll see if it, if it takes off or not. Uh, and this is a bounty hunter. So you might get, you know, uh, gun, you know, replica blasters or something like that. I'm not really, I haven't really been following much of those. I mean, I know they make lightsaber replicas. I don't know if they made, you know, other ones like, you know, Han Solo's gun or <sighs> stuff like that. Know that there are official Disney versions of that currently. I know there are a lot of of makers and stuff out there that make really accurate, nice ones. Skip just bought one at a con this weekend. He's got like a really accurate uh, Han Solo blaster that's that's got some weight and it's really metal and made. But I mean, I'm talking about like like why I think that that we might see some of that is for Outlaws, I I have seen way more promotional stuff out, like promotional stills and little cutesy pictures of the, the main character with Nick's on her shoulder and this and that all, all over the internet that I haven't seen for, for previous game releases, Star Wars or otherwise, that there's a lot of that kind of stuff out there already. Um. And I don't know that we've said yet, this game releases, I think, in August? August 30th. Yeah. Yeah, which I think is sooner than was initially expected. I think they said um, fourth quarter 2024. So um, hopefully it'll be in a playable <laughs> format when it does launch because Lucasfilm Games has had a couple of issues with the launches of their premier titles which has been a bit disappointing because they tend to only do one big blockbuster launch at a time and then have quite a few years between them. So um, I think most famously, Star Wars Battlefront 2 from 2017 had a lot of backlash against it because of how little game content was in there when it launched. Um, but it is one of the best uh, kind of recovery stories in modern video games because EA did listen and put in a lot of content and there were a lot of 
quality of life updates, a lot of DLC that was just available. They were developing more and more characters, more and more uh, ships and weapons and locales, and upgraded a very bare bones action game to something that had uh, a lot more depth and kind of sandbox play style in it. Um, and the other one that also had some issues at launch was Jedi Survivor. So that was the last Lucasfilm Games big launch uh, from last year. And obviously it was going off the coattails of Jedi Fallen Order, which was loved by pretty much everyone who played it. But because they had a tech, uh, quite a technological jump forward using uh, an upgraded game engine, there were a lot of performance issues on release. So buffering, drop frame rates, um, the kind of uh, draw distance between Cal and what you could see furthest at the horizon, there were some issues with that. Uh, assets popping up um, to the point where uh, some some gamers, some streamers who you know play video games for a living just didn't want to play it because they thought it was kind of unplayable and not a good watching, viewing experience for mm -hmm. their community, for their subscribers. So it did have quite a few problems um, at release, which have been kind of patched with DLC and supported months and weeks after after launch. This new so, game as well, Outlaws, they already said there's going to be a ton of DLC, which mm -hmm. means they're already planning not to have a bunch of the game in right. the, when you buy it, which is like, I don't understand the logic behind that, but... That seems to be the direction that most games have gone these days. It's like, oh, buy it, and then, oh, come back in a couple months and get more de more of what you played. Like, you buy it, and you can only have actually, like, 25% of the game, and then you got to get all the, the rest of it on DLCs later on. Yeah. Like, right, really about... and, then, and then it's paywalled, which is awful. Yeah. <laughs> well, have you it's... seen that there are already announced there will be three different levels of initial purchase? Is yes, you can purchase that the base game which who knows what's in that for, for 70 bucks. Okay. Um, there's the gold edition, which, you know, has a season pass. Who knows what that means is that's why it has the, the, the needs of network connection is that they're going to cut you off after X number of amount of time or, or cut off your download ability for new stuff. I don't know. Um, yeah. But seven, uh, 110 bucks for the gold edition, and the ultimate edition, um, which has the game, the season pass, you get to be the Sabak Shark bundle. So I don't know, is there an in-game I can play Sabak uh, with a digital image of, of Donald Glover or whatever? Uh, or actually, I suppose at this point it would be Billy D. Williams. Um, Rogue Infiltrator Bundle. I, I, I think maybe they're saying that these are different stories that they're including. So there's there's possibly multiple objectives in this. You can play the Sabak Shark and you have to do this. You can play the Rogue Infiltrator and do this. Uh, a digital art book and three days of early access when you pre-order it. And that's 130 bucks. 130 bucks for a PS5 game. Yeah, with no yeah. physical media. And yeah, and requiring the internet access and uh, hookup from the beginning. All right. Even if you do buy the physical copy, so you get the disc for you, you know your Xbox or PS5. Still need that to kind of, I guess, register mm -hmm. and um, authenticate your purchase, which is getting increasingly frustrating as the physical media seems to just be vanishing in every kind of genre and industry, whether it's film or gaming. Yeah. Now, well, physical um, media for games. Now you don't even play off the disc. It's like you, it's a pass key basically to download it from the store. I remember when I bought battlefront two and it's like, I bought it on a disc and the appeal was that cool. I can install it right away and start playing it. So my internet was terrible. Oh, you need to actually download it from the store now that you have the disc. Like, well, yep. What's the point of having the disc? It's like you can't uh, – it's like a free pass key just to download it. And then once you do download it, it's like if I downloaded it from the store, why do I need the disc in the console every time anyway? It's like why yeah. – I, I don't know. Because things have gotten so bloated 
Okay, you know, in in the old days, like you had to have programmers at, there at the company whose job it was to make sure the code is tight, it's in there, and everything fits on your media. As soon as you got away from when you got away from you know, okay, five and a half, five five and a half, three five and a quarter, three and a half CDs, then programs are coming on DVDs. And, and this is, yeah, I know this stuff is, is bigger and it's so much out there, but I, I am sure some of that is just like code bloat is, is you're doing it because you can. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, 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 yeah. It's also kind of following the what I call Fortnite model of having, so like the season pass thing to me is a red flag for a single player game immediately yeah. because you think of, um, you know, uh, battle Royale shooters. That's, that's a thing that Fortnite began well popularized. Then you had it in like apex legends and Valorant and all these other kind of team based, um, uh, fantasy styled uh, online shooters. And then you have season passes and things that are available in other completely different genre games like Minecraft. Um, and you have different iterations of the game. They'll add some bells and whistles. They'll have some extra content that is accessible in the game. And they'll have more skins, which is a huge thing. It's become a video game trope now that uh, developers can just get really quick, easy cash-ins by uh, just releasing more skins for your character, for your weapon, for whatever items you're using in-game, and sometimes not even in-game. It's sometimes the, the collector's edition version of a video game will be, oh, you have a digital uh, collectible that you can view when you're, you've loaded the game, but it's mm. not even something your character can use or see. I always find that really kind of dystopian as well. <laughs> you, that there's less physical media and then if you're going to pay out of pocket for something that's collector's edition or limited edition you don't even get the little figurine or statuette that you might have got 10 years ago right um or even a physical art book <laughs> there's no there's like well, a there lot of apparently i think well, digital it's, oh, see, it's a digital art book you're right is yeah. i i assumed when i said art book oh will you get an actual no exactly that's, yeah, that's a digital art book. Yeah, a digital art book. It's like no, I'm not gonna shelve no. out. And then when you you do yeah. the math, and it's like it doesn't come out to a good value to be paying all that extra money, uh, just for digital content, like you said, skins and you know stuff like that. Yeah. Plus, if you wait, if you're getting the digital version anyway, even the unlimited or the ultimate versions will go on sale eventually. But yeah, you know, well, don't but, even get so, me started on the level of the digital media and things. Because was it? It was this week or last week that came out too. Is like Funko started selling Funko NFTs. Why in the hell do I want an NFT of a Funko Pop? I, I still don't understand for the life of me why NFTs are popular. Yeah, what? I thought that had that train had. Uh, long gone. I was hoping that ship had sunk. I hadn't heard anyone say NFT for I, I like about 18 months. Real Funkos. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually one of the ones that you can get as an NFT is there's a Thrawn, I think. Probably. But, but I'm just like, oh my gracious. But yeah. Yeah. I thought they feel the Funkos. It, it will be in interesting to see. I, I want to know how much it. like hard drive space this is gonna take up on your PS5 and how how big the, the, the oh. world and bloat and things well, are gonna be and are we out to buying new hard drives for well to put that in perspective, I know that Gran Turismo seven takes up two hundred gigabytes if you have that on your hard drive. It's a ton of space. Now you can easily get a uh, plug it uh, attachable uh, external hard drives for PS5 or whatever. Um, that would be a good investment, so you don't have to get rid of your games. But yeah, I mean, but you you get what you pay for though, because the uh, graphics and stuff are absolutely amazing on modern games, and you can see where all the memory space is going. So yeah, it's not like it's crammed full of crap. But no, I mean yeah. it's true. Is is the the if you haven't again watched the trailer and you're still listening to this, I don't know why you should have gone out and watched the trailer. But it's it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. 
the engine is, the backdrops, the like I said, there was a few issues of like some tech and some vehicles that I thought were undershaded and looked a little bit too flat and um, not enough polygons or whatever that was. Eh. But uh, but a lot of it is is amazing. It's great. the The human characters are slightly wonky, but believable as far as gameplay is it's not like you know laura croft tomb raider from 1998 it it's 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 they're getting there yeah um who incidentally and, and, was was recently voted uh the most iconic video game character of all time by a uk european based video game magazine laura was croft that? that is Our laura croft, croft I, was, was I, actually I voted out that at all I want to say I saw something with a new Tomb Raider game or new technology looking fairly recently, but I, I don't know where. Don't quote me on that. Is I it may have just been something that's old that I hadn't seen before. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, but I, I I I think this is definitely worth continuing to watch. Am I going to go spend a hundred and thirty bucks? No, because I don't have a PS Five either. But. <laughs> Um, I'd be interested to see if they come out with like a PC edition or something other that, that I could get in on, or maybe I, I know enough of you are going to like be looking at it and enough of our other, our other friends will be that I, maybe this is, this is what makes me have to go get the console. And, and that should be, if it's not, that should be the goal of, of, I think at least the partnership of a gaming company with a, a, a console manufacturer. Yeah, it does have, uh, they do have plans, I think at launch to release on some PC um, kind of media. So there's the Amazon gaming subscription. Mm -hmm. uh, the name escapes me. I actually don't know anyone who uses it, but um, it will be available through that. It will also be available through the Epic Game Store. Um, and I, I saw as well that you will be able to get this if you have a monthly subscription to the Ubisoft or Ubisoft um, yeah. gaming whatever. Ubisoft it's... Plus. Where did they get that idea from? I haven't heard of a Plus <laughs> subscription before. Um, That'll be... Yeah. No, that, so to that, to me, was another little red flag because it seems like they're coordinating... The publishers, Ubisoft, the developers, massive. These guys from um, Sweden. They. It seems like they are kind of advertising and promoting Ubisoft Plus uh, in a like on mass mm -hmm. uh, wide beam kind of way to a lot of uh, gamers and potential gamers alongside this game. Um, so it's kind of to me that's a little. If I'm being a bit cynical, makes me think. Okay, it's. This is all just huge marketing for Ubisoft and the next Assassin's Creed, which uh, I think is going to be based in a samurai feudal era, um, which also seems to be very popular right now. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so there's a... But then on the other hand, there are some things to, aside from the visuals, um, to kind of make us think this could be a really good property. Uh, Nyx, the adorable alien companions, actually voiced by Dee Bradley Baker which to me seems massively unnecessary because <laughs> how much of a vo <laughs> vocal performance do you need? Um, well, but... e. Bradley Baker will do anything. Yeah, okay, he will. E. Bradley Baker is the voice of Eagly in, in the, the, uh, the Peacemaker for whatever reason. Peacemaker, was that what? Yeah, the, the John Cena craziness. Oh, so. okay. Yeah, Have so, you, do you know what I'm talking about? Am I calling it the wrong thing? Somebody correct me. I haven't seen Peacemaker, but could yeah. could be. I could imagine. Do you want to say so no? It, it's John Cena's eagle sidekick is voiced by D. Bradley Baker. It's, it's that level. Is it really though? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or he just has friends in high places. Yes. Um. But anyway, that I think it's worth a, a watch. Keep watching it. Keep watching it and see what happens as it goes. If you're not one of those that has to be the early adopter, just see and see what's going on. It looks promising. It looks cool. I find it really interesting that they've decided already pre-launch 
to make it canon and everything. So I, I think that'll be cool. So let's I talk. Think- let's talk about what we called. All right. Let's let's talk about Tales of the Empire. We're we're past the halfway point, and if we go long today, I don't care because Tales of the Empire and talking about that, talk about like some far reaching connotation and things that could happen and that are going on in this that that affect the star wars universe wow um initial reactions either one of you okay i love the trailer i thought it was um fantastic disney makes banging trailers (laughs) they hit out of the park every time um and it's a fun may the fourth release makes sense there was a lot of goodwill for Tales of the Jedi and a chance to expand. Um, and yeah, this this is the dark side, kind of other side of the coin to Tales of the Jedi. We've got two um, interesting characters that don't have a... Uh, either are missing a huge element of backstory in the case of Morgan Elspeth mm-hmm. or missing a kind of what happened next in Varys Afi. And to see those stories, I'm presuming it will be a, a three and three situation like we have with Tales of the Jedi. Um, so three shorts for one character, three shorts for the other. And it's bringing back some beloved villains like the Grand Inquisitor. Um, there's an idea of looking at the way the dark side trains their apprentices in mm-hmm. what Varys Offie goes through. Um, there's a great little scene where <laughs> there's like a ray shield surrounding her and another kind of prodigy where cage they're having a match. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> a ray shield at cage, cage match. And um, yeah, that felt like a gladiatorial kind of face off, um, probably to entertain the Grand Inquisitor. Uh, and then I don't know if this is a obviously kind of fan service of course to have the uh the last shot of the trailer being the breathing and the walking in of darth vader Mm -hmm. but it makes sense given where they're setting the story and the title tales of the empire you you need the most talismanic of all the imperials which is vader well Um, and so disney wants to get their money worth out of buying the rights to james earl jones's voice (laughs) yeah, <laughs> that sounded um, a little bit cynical. <laughs> <laughs> a little, well, no, okay. I I love the trailer. Yeah, I understand I'll, go, it. I'll go next. I, I love the trailer as well. I really like that we're going to see a further story of Barris Offie. All right, it, and I know Mark Van Olen. Mark, if you're watching this, I know you don't always watch live, but you watch on on the replay uh, religiously is like, ooh, Barisafi is like that. More back, well, not even backstory, but story beyond what we know. What's happening? What happened to her? Well, I think we're getting it. Um, Morgan Elsbeth, the backstory of what's going on. Is this going to be more content that it's got to? It's got to explain her motivation and her thing, how she got up with Thrawn. We see that in the trailer. And, and it's going to explain more of what's going on in The Mandalorian. We see her with the Beskar spear from, you know, that we we see it's going to allude to how she ends up in Ahsoka. Um, so it's definitely going right into everything that's happening. Um, and I think the really interesting part about Barris is they're not just using that, it appears. To tell us more of what happened to Barris, but Inquisitors in general. We're seeing more of the Inquisitors and more of what's happening. We're seeing different Inquisitors than we've seen other than the Grand Inquisitor. Um, there's a different sister. It's not Sarah Michelle Geller. It's somebody else. It's another one. I can't keep track of numbers. Of, they need to give people names because the 4th and the 6th yeah. and the 332nd, I don't know. Which sister is this? <laughs> Three point, the pie. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The, it's, they've got, and it was a good lineup to finish the trailer. And again, please watch it if you haven't already. Um, a lineup of the Inquisitors that are going to be maybe featured in this, or at least seen a little bit of. And we've got the return of the, the Inquisitor from the Ahsoka Tales of the Jedi final episode. Mm-hmm. 
um, that she memorably disarmed and defeated, uh, who had a very kind of iconic quack doctor look from like medieval times. Yeah, <laughs> is how I describe him. Um, and yeah, I I'm, I couldn't actually tell if it is uh, Jason Isaacs back as the Grand Inquisitor, but uh, I think his there was performance. Some debate on that in the chat, and I think somebody found that. It a minute, let me not look at IMDb on my computer that sometimes shut that shuts down stream yards but i've got the app okay uh, but um anyway. yeah he he gave one of the best performances i think in rebels and i, I was sad to see the grand inquisitor go so early in rebels as run i felt like the, you know he could have had more story but we're going to get some of this here in tales of the empire um and i think it's an interesting parallel to have barris off his kind of training and induction into the inquisitors um, versus what we've seen of the Jedi many times and seeing where her story goes after the season five finale of the Clone Wars because mm -hmm. you could say that, you know, like those episodes to catch a Jedi and the Jedi who knew too much, um, the wrong Jedi, that triplet of episodes was fantastic, but also, you know, she was kind of top billing with Ahsoka in that story arc. So to see what happened next will be hopefully an intriguing set of little stories we get and it does seem like the other side of what we've seen with Ahsoka and with Morgan Elspeth as well the way they intersect in the Mandalorian on the Corvus planet the very gray greeny and then the city of Kaladin where she becomes the magistrate we see some of those characters that we saw in the Mandalorian season two episode where Din brought Grogu to try and find Ahsoka, and then we met Morgan for the first time. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, and we and it is Jason Isaacs, by the way, listed on IMDb as the Grand Inquisitor. Good to know uh, Meredith Selinger as Barisafi, which is a new. That's not the original Barisafi. Um, Lars Mikkelsen as Thrawn. Diana Lee and Santo as Morgan Elsbeth. Oh, and we haven't even talked yet about Grievous. Okay, Matthew Wood as General Grievous in this, getting the, the lightsabers like a left field is like, give us an oldie but a goodie right there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and he looked great. He looked really imposing the way the camera kind of panned up to him and he's towering over uh, Morgan, I think, in that moment. Um, do you think that's going to be Morgan's story of escaping Dathomir when... In the Clone Wars arc, you had Grievous be sent to destroy the Night Sisters, or do you mm. think it might happen at a later time? I, I I am so very just from the way the trailer goes. Is she's like, well, all my people were slaughtered and everybody's gone, and that's my motivation for joining the Empire. I'm like, wait, weren't the people that destroyed the Night Sisters at least like Empire adjacent? Um. Uh, mm, yeah. I, I, I find that a little yeah. Uh, mm. yeah it kind of goes back to who actually knows who the emperor is pretty much nobody even though you feel like everyone should <laughs> exactly <laughs> um, he had a bit of a change of heart and face and voice um, but yeah I, I guess it's this this old kind of setup in Star Wars where you've got the our main characters kind of know what's going on and we eventually will know chronologically later in the original trilogy but for the most part Palpatine still seems to have deceived at least three quarters of the galaxy if not more <laughs> um, and they don't see the Separatist leader being the person who founded the Empire but I don't know I think that's just something we have to run with in Star Wars Palpatine hoodwinked everybody. Oh well, yeah, and um, oh, and Marak, Marak appears that you know the mis mystery character in right isn't that Marak? Am I wrong? That's appearing kind of on on top of a building or something in there. The the like yeah. green misty dude is like maybe we get to understand more of why he is the way he is. What is that dude? What was the thing? You know, a backstory that we all wanted that we didn't get, you know, spoilers for Ahsoka. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Kat, what did you like in the trailer? I like that it's just going to probably expand more on the evil of the Empire. Because uh, that era between uh, 3 and 4 is the one that's the most empty. Like, mm. yeah, we have Rogue One in the solo movie. Bad Batch, sort of, yeah, that has a bit there. But um, it'd be interesting to see the more inner mechanics of it. Like, Morgan Elizabeth, okay, we met her in Mandalorian. She's in charge of the company that builds all the Star Destroyers. Rather lacklusterly killed off in the Ahsoka show. So I don't know if people are going to care so much about her origin and one that's filling in a blank, but we might learn more about the Empire adjacent to that. Same with Barisafi, it might be finishing her story or filling more of it in. And I like the, hopefully the episodes are a bit better than some of the Tales of the Jedi were a bit off. It was kind of a mixed bag. So I hope this one's uh, more on point. But I'm kind of excited to see Thrawn and because they're going to have to. Because the question is, are they going to obey the new canon trilogy uh, trilogies of Thrawn novels, which are set in that time period, or are they not? Mm. So that's something to think about. So, Tales of the Jedi is canon, yes? Yeah. So, one would assume the same for this, but what do they choose to, to do and bend and wiggle their way around? Because... Again, Tales of the Jedi's canon, the Ahsoka audio drama I thought was supposed to be canon, but maybe it wasn't. And I don't know that they contradicted each other, but they were very... It was close to contradicting each other if it wasn't. Um, yeah. I yeah, that being a point of contention for some book readers and drama listeners. Yeah, well, and it's the same thing. The, the, and it's not like they haven't played that fine line before because people have have been um, all up in arms about uh, Asajj's appearance in Bad Batch and what happens to Asajj in Dark Disciple. And they're like, eh. but from a certain point of view, it, you never, it could be, it, yeah. That they're they're walking a fine line, or they're zigging and zagging in and out of the line, and like what you like, don't like what you don't like. Is is I, I think there's a lot there to be told. Um, yeah, so exactly. let, let's talk about let's go with stay with tales of the jet the empire. See, and go with like predictions. What what do you think from the trailer? that could be a point of interest in things that you think that they're going to expand on. Now, keeping in mind that there's, we're not going to get a ton if they follow the same thing, because those were pretty short episodes and they kind of intertwined them. They did one here and then two tales about Ahsoka. And like, where do you think this is going to go and what are we going to get and what's going to come from it? Cause I mean, I, I, I thought, Again, spoilers for, for Tales of the Jedi. If you haven't seen it, what is wrong with you? Where have you been? Um, but Bryce Dallas Howard is Yaddle. That's there's your surprise, and there's your crazy is what's going on. So what do you what do you think we have coming? I think we might have more Tales of the Jedi still on the slate. Firstly, mm -hmm. that's not quite answering your question, but there was, I think, um, an announcement from officially from Star Wars that, uh, and Dave Filoni confirmed that there was a Tales of the Jedi Part Two, yeah, um, which will be distinct from this. Even though <laughs> he had a nice graphic at the end of this trailer that said Tales of the Jedi, wait, what burned away Empire, mm. um, which was a nice little animation, and so we will be getting more stories in this format, and. The whole team behind the Bad Batch has pretty much wrapped on the final season, and we'll see what goes on with there. But you're going to have a lot of Lucasfilm animation being maybe free now to tell more stories. Um, but in in this one, I think uh, seeing just the kind of the curtain be unveiled on the dark side and the Empire, and and how they recruit, who they do recruit to become Inquisitors. Mm -hmm. And we know that 
there are some disillusioned Jedi that can become part of their stock. Um, they can take, you know, um, apprentices from the time of um, Operation Nightfall during Revenge of the Sith when Anakin stormed the temple. We saw that with um, Reva in, in the Obi Wan series. So the standard has been set to see Jedi at different ages of the training to you fall under the sway of the Inquisitors and be embraced by the Imperial fold and the dark side specifically. So um, seeing that transition for Barris will be interesting because we know she's a lot more experienced and, <laughs> and a lot more scarred than maybe Reva was at that time. And so seeing what becomes of her story afterwards, will she become a faceless Inquisitor that we've already seen later on? Mm. Or will her story end? Will she try and hopefully doesn't go down the route of trying to betray Vader and getting stabbed but not quite dying? Um, we've seen that already. Yeah, but um, done yeah, that. There's, there's, I think, more to see from the Grand Inquisitor, which I'm the most excited about and glad to hear Jason Isaacs reconfirmed. Um, and with Morgan, I guess we're going to see more of the other force users and what what they really do and what they might believe in in the night sisters because we don't really have much of their ideology or yeah. what their motivations are other than existing and producing offspring that Sidious Palpatine occasionally wants to recruit into his apprenticeship um, they're not really outlined in the way that we've got Jedi and the Sith um, so we might well, we've talked about this on the show that. before too is I want to see Night Sister magic because we've discussed is Night Sister magic the force? Is it something else? Is it just a different point of view and belief of the same spirit thing that surrounds and binds the universe together? And and could we get are are they gonna go that deep? I don't know. I think we saw Night Sister magic. Like I said, I think Mark was Night Sister Magic. We saw Morgan Definitely fighting was, with energized blades that weren't like lightsabers. Yeah, similar so, to the, the swords that she um, revealed towards the end of the Ahsoka series. Yeah, had that kind of almost poison-looking black pattern mm -hmm. to the blades. Um, I, I think um, that is an exciting place to be, is, is finding out more about some other explanation of the universe that's not necessarily the force or is it if they make night sister magic canonized as the force i don't think i'll be mad about that i think that's kind of like a cool thing stating that there can be multiple doctrines and religions that explain and expound the same thing and my oh my the number of shows that that will make for this show where we can discuss that as, as opposed to real life and how oh wait how many religions are actually explaining what the same stuff that happened go uh, <laughs> yeah but, kind of the church of the night sister let's see what that's about yeah <laughs> um, um but yeah. Here's one thing, uh, a possibility that I'm excited to see if they explore. Barisafi is a former Jedi. Barisafi, we know from the the arc where Ahsoka is leaves the Jedi Order, is very familiar with Anakin Skywalker, who's yeah. who whose new master is now Darth Vader. Does she know? Does she find out? How? I, hmm. I think that's, that's a crazy thing to think about and, and places to go. You know what I mean? Yeah. And again, it comes almost down to like, who knows the real identity of the super villains running the empire. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like an unsaid, unwritten rule that Darth Vader is just considered something else and something kind of totally inhuman and terrifying to the rest of the galaxy. Um, but there's not much connecting him to Anakin Skywalker 
in in galaxy in in story in universe but obviously there's loads that we know i mean so will they yeah have that tension that dramatic tension running we don't have that much time in these short form episodes right. but a bit of dialogue cleverly written by feloni at all could really flesh that out nicely because in universe you can count very quickly we we have well and then we have luke palpatine ahsoka obi-wan um is that it that might be it yeah i guess reva yeah um yeah but again the more the more people that know that truth the harder it seems to believe even though we're in a massive universe of make-believe anyway but you know in terms of story consistency um but yeah i'm I'd like to see more of the Night Sisters and uh, how Morgan become swears fealty to Thrawn so kind of severely and mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> with so much depth. Because in Ahsoka, it felt like you know she would do absolutely anything for him, and absolutely believed pretty much anything he said, even if it was a little um, either on the nose or a little nonsensical in terms of his strategy to try and stop Ahsoka from leaving, or um, you know. Uh, move in on the forces that he felt were a threat to him. Well, and I think I've got to go back and watch parts of Ahsoka now because this is coming. Before this comes, I need to clear in my mind some things that happened because Morgan is here in this universe or this galaxy. Okay, Morgan is here in the Mandalorian. Morgan is here in the beginning of um, Ahsoka. Morgan doesn't meet Thrawn until they go to the other galaxy. But she has. Now we get to see when she met and pledged allegiance. Because I don't remember, in all honesty, I guess she she was going to the other galaxy to meet Thrawn. Did she know that Thrawn was calling her there? Was she going purposely to see Thrawn? Or did she know and expect to see other Night Sisters there with Thrawn? I don't remember that. Mm. I need to go back and rewatch. Right. In the um, the episode where Morgan uses the kind of star map and the rest of the pieces are given to her by Sabine, um, well, to, to that to their side, uh, she mentions that she there's a calling to her. There's a, like mm-hmm. a an abstract calling out through the galaxy from this other side. Um, it's almost similarly described by Ray Stevenson's character um, that there's this like other purpose or other source that's drawing them to the far out beyond this galaxy. And um, when Morgan talks about it in the show. I remember there's a you can hear this kind of whispering sound that sounds like the kind of chanting that you associate with Night Sisters. So maybe their version of harnessing the force is through the Night Sister magic. That that's kind of it will do similar thing to them that the force would do for a Jedi or a Sith. That you know they they can they have some kind of telepathy um, mm-hmm. that can cross distance. Distance is relevant. It's kind do of Night Sisters have an M count. They're drawn, <laughs> <laughs> and another kettle of fish is opened. Yeah, well, I think the Bad Batch has made it quite clear that, um, you know, M count that there is that aspect of Star Wars biology that's in everything that's alive, mm-hmm. um, and it's kind of reinforced that idea, which might have been either willfully forgotten or um, just slipped out of mind from the phantom menace which is what qui-gon clearly says when he's explaining it to anakin um, with the blood test so yeah i i'd assume that night sisters have a higher m count than the non-force sensitive peoples of the galaxy and it would be yeah Uh, again that's going to depend on what they say what they do and is Night Sister Magic the Force? Because if it's not, not. If it is, yes. Yeah. 
I think because George Lucas kind of made the force the kind of quick way of accessing the 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 unseen and the phenomenal and the uh, the sort of magic in this universe that it will or it could it would fit that it's just a, another name for force ability for sensitivity to have night sisters that can perform that magic it's uh an unseen force um they can summon things it seems a little more uh well it's definitely a lot spookier it's a lot more yeah. kind of does it feel like it's dark sidey well if you're resurrecting the dead <laughs> and creating zombies then that seems kind of sith ish yeah <laughs> so and yeah. i think yeah. I think what we find out in Tales of the Jedi, though it may not be spoilery, may be Tales of the Jedi, I keep calling it, Tales of the Empire. What we find out in this may relate to, and we may see even more of, and it be made more important but by what we find out in a potential Ahsoka Season 2 or wherever that story is written up, by where is Ahsoka, a Sabine, Balin, and Shin going <laughs> you know it's like where are they going and finding out the whole shabam mm -hmm. so I, I think we're we're over time and we're there but I think two really cool properties coming and even more cool properties coming we talked about the acolyte last time and, yeah. and we keep getting more drops and stuff of the acolyte there is so much Star Wars coming and coming and coming. And and we don't even know what else is coming because they drop this on us out of nowhere. Yeah. Well, actually, I just saw something uh, very recent, just earlier today, that um, the uh, ahead of the CinemaCon panel in Vegas, I don't know if that's, I think that's next week, mm -hmm. um, that there's a Disney slate that has... Uh, Dave Filoni's film, The Mandalorian and Grogu, mm -hmm. uh, for May 22nd, 2026. Yeah. So it's quite far down the pipe, but it's there. Hopefully it won't disappear like other Star Wars film properties have. <laughs> yeah, um, I wouldn't think of... <sighs> well, okay, wait, wait. What did they say for 26? Is Filoni's movie or Favreau's movie? Um, isn't... The, the... The film that's Mando called Grover. Mando yeah, and Grogu. Mando and I thought, Grogu. Maybe I'm wrong. I thought that was like a Favreau, and the Filoni one is going to be the one that's called, uh, oh, the name of the original Thrawn trilogy. Help me. Oh, it's the Empire. Yes, that's called oh. like Filoni was is is tentatively called heir to the Empire, and then Mandalorian and Grogu was maybe more of a of Favreau. But I'm. Uh. I don't know. I, th I, yeah, I, I hear so many things and back and forth and the other mm -hmm. is. I think the Heir to the Empire was just like a tentative, yeah, exactly as you say, tentative name um, and kind of speculation and that's Filoni's answer to people has been it's that project so people know what's kind of going on yeah. and that Thrawn will feature and it'll be the culmination of um, a lot of the post-Return of the Jedi TV shows the Mandoverse in a way. But yeah, then I, I think that that's going to be Avengers Endgame. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or maybe Infinity War, depending on which <laughs> part well, of the well. Avengers you like more. Um, yeah, but uh, I think also the having uh, Bob Iger back overall might give more stability to Star Wars behind the scenes. And he was in charge when you had the huge build-up and hype for Infinity War and then Endgame. So, yeah, this could be Star Wars's turn to do something yeah. similar. I, I I think so, and and I think, like I said, more and more stuff coming out there. Having this, having this, this more backstory in canon, having these entire other worlds and this whole crime syndicate universe. Hey, let it be good for crying out loud, and let us get a live action version of that. Um, yeah. That 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 that's the kind of thing that that would be cool. Is you want to tell more stories from the current sacred timeline? Go there. Go to other people in the universe, and maybe it crosses paths with people. That that'd be a great way 
to we cross paths with Han Solo, but he's frozen in freaking carbonite, so it doesn't affect anything else, and we move on. Hmm. Yeah, I just feel like everyone that we saw in Jabba's palace in Return of the Jedi, including Lando, could easily have something to do with uh, KVS and her her friends. Yeah. And I mean, Bill, you... Billy D. Williams recently turned eighty-seven, I think, last week. So, he could, I mean, I'm sure he'd be down to voice a little more, Lando. <laughs> Yeah, you get him to voice some Lando. Tell us in in like a Tales of the Smugglers. Give us an animated version of that. Tales yeah. of the Smugglers. I'm like calling it yeah. here. Tales um, from Mos Eisley Cantina. Or Just again, give us yeah. the Calrissian Chronicles between and go back and forth between Donald Glover and Billy D. Williams, the voice of Billy D. Williams, or Billy D. Williams just sitting in a chair reading a book, telling a story. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like, like the Princess Bride almost. Go. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like. Yeah, like Lan Billy D. Williams can be Peter Fork in The Princess Bride. <laughs> Here's a story, a tale from long ago. Absolutely. Um, but oh, one oh, yeah. also thing that I learned, which I think could be a good move from behind the scenes Disney, is that uh, one of the key writers in season one of Andor, who actually wrote one of the most beloved episodes, The One mm -hmm. Way Out, with mm -hmm. the grandstanding Luthan Rail soliloquy speech. Yeah. Uh, Bo Willem Willeman. He is uh, going to be co-writing Dawn of the Jedi with James Mangold. Nice. So if that stays true, that could be a nice stable well, base to build that from. We've mentioned that many, many times is why on earth don't we have writers actually writing movies and why do we have directors writing movies? Let's have writers write movies. Yeah. It, it just only makes sense. But yeah, we're there. We're over the time. We're there. Um, uh, like people, if you have questions or comments or you think we, we said something that was completely wrong and it's entirely possible that I did because I just go. Uh, but make it in the comments. We'll address it on a future show. We'll talk if you have topics for us. We've got some really cool topics coming up um, because we're wrapping up on the watch alongs and things. We're wrapping up Bad Batch. It's coming to an end. Um, we'll probably talk about that. Acolyte is coming. We talked about Acolyte last week. We're going to be talking about it some more. Some really kind of Sith centric things and things to get you ready for the Acolyte. If you're not excited about it if you're if you don't know all of the little minutia that might make this important um we're going to try and talk about that some of you and get get you a little bit more ready for that in in episodes to come so um for everybody for me dave for oh, other that way for cat and for geo until next time may the force be with you may the force be with you all Thanks for tuning in.